Welcome back to season three of my podcast. I am Amanda Blackwood, the survivor. As many of you know, I wrote my autobiography as a survivor of human trafficking called Custom Justice. For those of you who didn't know, now you do. Keeping in line with that, this entire season is going to be focused on interviewing other trauma survivors who did or plan to write about their own experiences as trauma survivors and how they overcame their past. Get ready to hear from some truly incredible people. Please hang on for a moment through this brief advertisement. This is what currently pays for the show. Of course, I will also take donations through PayPal to keep the show running, or you can show support by a simple book purchase. I have quite a few out there. Just look for books by Amanda Blackwood on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Your purchase does go to helping to support local organizations that help fight human trafficking also. So with me today is Jasmine Schaus. Jasmine is a personal hero of mine. She doesn't know this yet. Well, she does now because I've just said it. Um, And I don't think that you guys are going to be surprised when I tell you why. Not only did she survive unspeakable assaults while she was in the military, but this incredible woman did a lot of counter-trafficking work when she was in the military, too. She worked with Intel mostly, so she didn't get to talk to many of the survivors, she told me, but she struggled with a lot of self-hate and despair, thinking about the ones that she couldn't get to in time, which, of course, I can relate to. Most survivors can. It's called survivor's guilt for the survivors. But it's known as Schindler syndrome in the cases of these incredible people like Jasmine. No matter how many people someone saves, they always believe there could have been just one more. But a hero is a hero. And Jasmine, you are incredible. So on behalf of all the survivors around the world, thank you for everything that you have done. We love you. And thank you for being here with me today. Thank you so much. You are really a remarkable person. And I knew the second that I saw what you said um, about having done the Intel work, it just, I needed to get to know you. I think you're amazing. And it really is. It's a Schindler syndrome. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Schindler's List. If you haven't, then you might relate with him in a big way. Um, uh, well, not with the beginning part, because he was not a very good person in the beginning, but he turned out <laughs> to be pretty awesome. <laughs> so I haven't seen it. I've heard of it, but I haven't seen it yet. Oh, it's definitely worth seeing, but keep your tissue box handy. It's tough. Yeah. Um, so... Where did you grow up? What was your family life like? Where were you? All that good stuff. Uh, So I was actually born in Denver, Colorado area. Um, My mom and I lived there for a couple of years, and then she moved up to Montana. Uh, So it was just her and me uh, for a little while, and she met my stepdad, and they're still together 27 years later. So it worked out for them. That's awesome. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, uh, but he was a truck driver, so he was gone most of the time. So it was still my mom and me. Um, <laughs> I had some foster siblings growing up. Uh, was my parents became foster parents in order to be able to get my best friend out of foster care. Wow. Uh, so I had a couple of foster siblings uh, in high school. But otherwise, it was mostly me, my dogs. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. So your mom is, is like you, too. She wants to help wherever she can. I love that. She's a pharmacy technician now. And before that, she worked as an office manager in a veterinary clinic. So she's very much one of the, like, let me help wherever I can type of people. Wow, that's fantastic. Well, I- <laughs> <laughs> So you've been through a lot, uh, mainly in the military. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, my The first time I was assaulted happened before I joined. It was when I was in high school. But... Um, it happened a couple more times while I was in service, different people. Um, wow. And then doing the job that I did, it was that secondary reac- reactionary type of um, trauma and experience. Um, nothing compared to what the people who actually lived through it went through. It's, it's difficult, though, um, for people many people I've found since getting out of the service, many people have also expressed like how difficult it was doing the job we were doing. Right. Right. Well, I mean, that's, it's going to be a trauma reaction no matter what. And one of the things that I constantly tell people 
whenever I'm on stage and, and doing my talks and stuff is that trauma doesn't just alter the way that we think or react to things. It alters the way that we live our lives. So trauma is in its own right, its own entity. You can't really rightfully compare your trauma or my trauma to somebody else's trauma because my trauma didn't change their life and their trauma didn't change my life. It exists and therefore it is a terrible thing. And there, there is no real comparison ever. Yeah. Uh, what you Everybody is... Go ahead. Yeah, everybody's story is different, but um, yeah, none of us are alone in it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So going through all of that, how has that impacted your life and the way that you live it now? Uh, I've spent the last couple of years, because I did get out of the service a part, and in large part due to that. Um, so the past couple of years have been spent trying to reacclimate to civilian life and to stabilize because uh, I did end up in the hospital for... Um, suicide risk and so trying to come back from that um, has been dealing with a lot of you know paranoia and fear of things that are out there that I know to be true and exist but trying to rationalize it to the point of likelihood of it uh, as well as turning to the writing to uh, be cathartic, cathartic and get the story out there that's fantastic. That's exactly what uh, I was able to do to help kind of move past everything that I'd been through. So, and I know you've had several different resources and stuff in your time to be able to help you heal from the trauma. What do you think have been some of the biggest things that you've done to really help you move past it? It's not always the most, um, uh, the most ready answer that people give but being hospitalized like yeah. really gave me a whole new perspective on things it made me focus on the healing and on the treatment and and getting through the hardest hurdles of uh, wanting to to not be here anymore and to move forward and be here for my kids and my husband and I love that you address that it's not the common answer because it's really not. Um, a lot of people don't want to, to address that part of their life. And a lot of people don't have the opportunity to be hospitalized. A lot of people don't seek that help. So they never get there. And I, I think it's really important to hear when we've got somebody like yourself that found the hospitalization to actually be one of the greatest things to be able to help you. Because so many people are terrified of reporting a loved one because the loved one doesn't want to be in the hospital. They don't want to be hospitalized. They don't want that help. And it's so important to understand that sometimes that help is exactly what somebody needs, whether they want it or not. Yeah, exactly. I did not go willingly. I was not pleased about having to go. But when I got there and after a few days, I realized that it was exactly what I needed when I needed it before yes. it became too late. That's pretty amazing. I, I'm really glad that you got your assistance that you needed and you're here with us today because you're, you're remarkable. Thank uh, you. Do you have people in your life that were really helpful in your recovery process? I know you mentioned your kids and your husband. Did you find them to be helpful or inspiring? Uh, my kids were very young. Uh, they're still pretty young, but they, it was, they do enjoy life. They are very much like uh, go out there and do whatever occurs to them to, you know, go play on the swing set, find the little things in life that are just so much fun to them. And it's really great to see. My <laughs> husband was extremely supportive. Um, I don't think he realized my depression was as bad as it was until, until it happened. Uh, but when it did, he immediately has just been everything. Uh, to support he does not make fun of me or argue or anything about my medication and he tries to remind me to take it even uh he's he's been incredible and it really made me realize what I would have missed that's very cool how long have you two been married uh eight years wow that's awesome I love hearing that so my husband and I just got married at the beginning of this year 
Well, <laughs> congratulations. January. Thank you. And it's the first time in my life I've found somebody that sounds like that, that he's supportive and kind and gentle and he gets it. And if he doesn't get it, when he does get it, it really sinks in hard and he's all over it. He's like, no, I've got this. Love yeah, that. The support is invaluable. Yeah, it really is. My best friend was amazing too at the time. Like she had a different experience in the hospital than I did. And then she found out that I was there. She was like, I, do you want me to come down and get you out? I will. I promise. I'll, and she lives in Montana still. And we were in Texas at the time. And so she was, she was immediately just right there for me the entire time. Wow. Is that the one that your mom got out of foster care? No, it's a different one. Wow. It's pretty awesome that you have these friends in your life that you've known like this. Yeah. That's some neat. of my friends have been really great over the years. Yeah. Yeah. I got a couple of those. I wouldn't trade them for the world. <laughs> so whenever you have a little win in life, whenever you do something or you accomplish a task or you write a part in your book that's been really difficult, do you have different ways that you like to celebrate your little wins? I like to, it depends on, honestly, um, if it's something like nailing a part in the book that I'm writing, uh, it makes it, it just sounds perfect. And it's exactly what I want it to be. I'll get some ice cream, like mm -hmm. it's just something simple. Uh, nice. If it's something where I've had like a, a rough day or some kind of um, breakthroughs in therapy or a little bit more heavy topic wise, uh, I'll, I'll go buy a new book or at least just go to the bookstore and get a chai. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds like a great plan. <laughs> I like that. The ice cream thing, especially. Um, I need to stop eating it once every two days and probably only do it for special occasions like that. <laughs> I had to come up with a trick where I will get a bag of carrots and anytime that I want ice cream when it's not celebrating something, I just eat some carrots. <laughs> okay, that's genius. I may have to do that. <laughs> So what's one thing that you wish you could tell someone who's going through what you went through back then? Hold on. And that you're not alone. Everybody's challenges and issues are completely different. Nobody's lived experience is the same. But they're similar enough that the community is there to support you. Awesome. Is there anything that you wish you could offer to survivors of uh, similar experiences? I wish I could. I, I wish I could take away their pain. That's not at all possible. But I'm absolutely always willing to hear somebody's story if they're willing to tell it or to be to talk about anything that they're interested in. If they find some kind of other passion that they they want to share. I may not know about it, but I will love seeing your eyes light up about it. That's awesome. Very cool. So, and I know that you did write your book about, um, and, and how it relates to your experiences. How does it relate to your experience? Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah. Uh, my book is called Insanely Sane, and it is set in the mental hospital treatment center uh, uh, where 10 different lives have intersected on the ward. It's a young adult story rather than when I went in at 29. Uh, but it's about how these different lives come together and their traumas and their histories and the things that happen to them. So many stories are about the things that happened and you don't see what happens next, how they get past it and how they can start to live their life again. And so that's what I wanted to focus on with this book was to show that healing part of it that the things do continue on that's awesome do you have any of it that you would like to read for our listeners uh sure okay. this is from a character called matthew i waited a few minutes before i went inside renee stood at the bookcase with stacks of books on the three tables surrounding you know the books are supposed to go on the shelves right I leaned on one of the chairs and watched her sort through the stack, placing a book with a blue cover on one pile and one with a darker blue cover on a different. When she finally looked up, I could see her eyes were red-rimmed and kind of puffy. Sorry, I lamented. What happened? She shrugged and returned her attention to the books. This helps calm me down, she explained, but I could barely hear her over the noise coming from the other common room. 
So what are you doing with them? Sorting by genre and author. You're alphabetizing the ward's bookshelf. I stared at her. Renee kept up her work, glancing back at the back of the book before moving it to a pile. It's distracting. Okay, said slowly. Then do you want help? She shrugged again. If you want. What do you want me to do? I picked up one of the books from the table. It had a picture of a cowboy kissing a girl on the cover. And why is this in a teen ward? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so where can people find your book when they're looking for Insanely Sane? Right now, we did a digital release of it on Amazon. So it's on Kindle Unlimited. And the physical copies will be made available coming out September 10th for World Suicide Prevention Day. Oh, that's fantastic. I love that, Jasmine. That's oh so cool. Um, I'm probably going to grab the Kindle version. I don't have Kindle Unlimited, so I'm going to pay for it. Um, but as soon as that comes out in the paperback, you better believe I'm going to have that on my shelf. I can't wait to grab a hold of that book. Oh, thank that's you awesome. so much. That's my really publisher cool. and I have worked really hard on developing some uh, discussion questions and some mental health exercises, meditations, things like that to go in the back along with resources. Oh, very cool. What, what do you think was the best piece of advice that you got from that? Uh, to keep trying. The yeah. Therapy is not one size fit all. Um, you might not have a counselor that you necessarily vibe with or the medication isn't the one that's going to work. But if you give up, then it's you're not going to find the one that works. So just keep trying. Yes, absolutely. I've interviewed a couple of therapists on my podcast in the last couple of weeks or so. Um, and that's what both of them said was, you know, we're not going to take it personally. If you don't like us, you need to find a therapist, a counselor that you like, that you trust, because otherwise you're not going to get anything out of it. And that therapist is just going to be wasting their time. You're going to be wasting your money. Just keep trying. Don't give up. Absolutely. I've had some really not so great therapists and I've had some incredible ones. Yeah. Yeah. I went through a couple different therapists in 2019 myself. And the first one was, I thought she was helpful, but it wasn't until I met the second one that I realized how wrong I was. I didn't know enough about therapy and counseling to understand that she really wasn't doing a whole lot to help. She was just offering a listening ear. She had no idea how to deal with what I was dealing with either, which has a lot to do with it. <laughs> yeah, different therapists have different specialties. Some deal with family trauma. Some deal with generational or couples counseling, kids yeah. counseling. And some, you need the very specialty ones for Trump, for PTSD or military or other things like that. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And my first therapist, she was kind of a general family therapist, and she had no idea what she was doing. And the second one was a uh, trauma specialist. And she dealt with mainly human trafficking survivors. And she was just absolutely phenomenal with what she was able to do and to unlock in my brain. I don't know if I would have ever written my autobiography without her help. She was unbelievable. And yeah, as again, don't give up. Just because one counselor isn't helping you and it's not the right fit doesn't mean that somebody else can't. I just, I love that message. I can't say it enough. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible that she was able to help you like that. I got really lucky. She was an amazing person. She actually volunteered for one of the local animal, uh, animal rescues. Uh, well, yeah, I guess I was an animal rescue. <laughs> oh <my laughs> she, she helped with one of the uh, local anti-trafficking organizations that I was involved with at the time. And uh, yeah, she was super cool. She came along at exactly the right moment when I needed her most. Sometimes yeah. the best people do that. They surprise you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's always one more question that I ask people before I let them go. But I'm going to hold off on that. And I'm going to ask you first, is there anything else that you wanted to add? Or did you have any questions that you want uh, to let people know about any other projects you got going on, anything like that? Um, the only thing is that if this book sounds like something that you're interested in, please, please, please check trigger warnings. There's a note at the very front saying this is what's contained in it. And at any point in time that you feel like it's too much, stop. I'm not offended by you stopping reading and taking care of yourself. 
Yes, I love that. I tell people that in person when it comes to my autobiography, but I don't have a trigger warning on the outside of the book and I need to fix that. It's a very good point. So the the last question that I always ask people is kind of about how you see yourself now that you come through all of this stuff. So what is one thing that you love about yourself that is not based on your physical appearance? Uh, I, that is a hard question. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I love that I'm doing what I love. Uh, I've wanted to write since I was eight years old. And so, uh, I've got four books out now and I, I love that that's what I persevered and started doing. Oh, that's awesome. That's fantastic. Me too, by the way, since I was a little kid, I've always wanted to be a writer. (laughs) We tend to find each other. (laughs) Yes. Yes, we do. (laughs) Uh, So I know this is your fourth book. This is super exciting. Um, Anytime you have another book coming out or if you've got anything going on with any of your books, please reach out to me and let me know. I'd love to talk about it on social media and let people have the information that they would need to be able to uh, jump on board and, and read your books and follow along with your social media. And I've got all that stuff into the description of the podcast also. So all the listeners can follow you at your website, which is jasminshousewriting.com on TikTok at Jazzy J box. I think that's the cutest name and Twitter at Jazzy J box, right? Yep. Awesome. All right, you guys follow Jasmine, check out her book. I know I'm going to, and I'm planning on reading it in the month of September for suicide awareness. So, uh, thank you, Jasmine. I really do. I very much appreciate you being here with me and I love you for everything that you've done and everything that you keep doing. You're just a remarkable person. So proud of you. Thank you. You are too. Everything you're doing and and speaking out and trying to take action is just so phenomenal. (laughs) Thank you. I don't know if it's uh, brave or stupid, but whatever it is, I'm going to keep doing it. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to go with brave. (laughs) Thank you. I will let you. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Jasmine, have a wonderful day. Thank you again. I really, I appreciate you and you're just awesome. Thank you for having me. Have a good night. Thanks, you too. If you've enjoyed tonight's episode, make sure that you head on over and check out the episode description. You will find links on how you can both support this podcast and how you can actually follow this author on social media. Check out their website, find their books, find their blogs. Whatever it is that they provide me with is what I provide in the episode description. So check it out. Go support our people.